Okay, good morning, guys. <clears throat> um, today we're going to go over parallel rack systems. We're going to cover um, kind of the basic rack system functions and some condensing strategies, as well as some CO2 uh, subcritical applications. So um, we're going to cover, cover quite a bit today. If you guys have any questions, I'll stop a couple of times so we can discuss um, throughout the PowerPoint. So. So parallel rack systems, um, they're multiple temperatures. Uh, the way that they run multiple temperatures is two ways. They run separate suction groups across that uh, back of that rack on those what's called a header, a suction header. So you can have a, what's called a split header. So sometimes you'll have a dedicated rack that runs just one suction group pressure. And then it'll use what you see here if you guys, can you guys see my cursor on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what you're looking at right here on the back of the rack, these are EPRs. They're mechanical valves. Um, there's electronic EPRs as well, but in this application, you're looking at a. Uh, these are um, Parker sport valves that we're looking at right here with a suction stop. That's where you see that solenoid on top. The suction stops used for for the defrost, but this is where we're actually managing the pressure uh, of the evaporators. Uh, we're regulating that pressure and how much it's allowed to flow through that valve at one time. And that's what actually dictates the temperature of that circuit. So um, if you have multiple systems running on that circuit, the other way that you can um, get a little bit of variation in your temperature is through your expansion valve superheat. So those are going to be the two adjustments that you make on a, on a supermarket system to make your temp adjustments. You're going to use, you're going to have your, uh, your monitoring or, or EMS system in there telling you what the temperature is, but your actual adjustments will come. Um, from you know overall calibration will come from this EPR and then your finite calibration will come from um, your TXVs. Uh, you've got multiple compressors on a parallel rack system. These are used for staging. So you may have other stages involved. This like this, so this may be stage one compressor right here, but you may have an unloader or it may be a Verispeed compressor. So these are Bitzer uh, Octagon uh, compressors. Um, I do like bits of compressors for one reason. They use a, a bigger a piston and a, and, and a shorter stroke. So they're a, little, they're a little bit more robust for taking some liquid than some of the other brands. Um, Copeland Discus is also very robust when it's taking a little bit of a drink of liquid uh, when it comes to uh, these rack systems. Uh, it uses a common refrigerant oil. So, and that's usually you'll see that through this oil separator. It's that blue cylinder there on the end. This one does not have a separate in a reservoir, it's all in one. Uh, so usually you'll see a, a big canister separator with a float and then a reservoir. Or if you're dealing with like a turbochet or a high pressure separator, it'll all be in one. The discharge lines will come into one separator and then it'll have what looks like an expansion valve on the back, but it's just an oil regulating valve to step down that pressure as it enters the oil, uh, enters the compressor uh, crankcase. <clears throat> Here's the three different brands that we most, most or almost all the time see on parallel racks. So what you've got here is you've got your electrical cabinet up here. You're going to see the, you know, that, that picture before, if you're talking to us on the phone, um, we're, we're going to be talking to you on the phone. We're going to ask you to look at the back side of the rack. That's where most of your controls and valves and whatnot are uh, as far as your um, mechanical controls, like I said right there with your EPRs. Uh, on the front of the rack, you're going to have your, your oil floats, your oil pumps for the compressors. You're going to have your visibility to your discharge valve, king valve, which is right here or right here on the compressor. Um, and then you're going to have your safety controls right here, your, your head pressure and low pressure, um, and possibly your oil control. So, or your demand cooling control, which is a desuperheating control. Um, and then this, you know, you'll see your, this is a, um, horizontal receiver with a, um, a digital float that's sending a signal up to this controller right here, telling it what percentage of liquid is in that receiver. So over here, you have your oil separator. So, and like I said, you, sometimes you'll have the oil separator and reservoir all in one. If your separator has the discharge line going directly into it, and then it's got side glasses on the separator, then it's acting as both components. So if you're dealing with a low pressure float oil system, you'll have a separator that goes up to a float uh, reservoir, a separate reservoir that usually sits a little bit higher on the rack. 
and then that reservoir will go down and feed your floats along here, which is right here. This is an oil float. So um, I will tell you one thing about adjusting oil floats is usually they come pretty pre-adjusted and you can make small adjustments to it, but if you're having to get on that oil float uh, pretty heavily to get it adjusted, nine times out of 10, just change the float because you're gonna come back because it's sticking. So that would be my suggestion with floats. I've seen a lot of guys try to adjust these and almost every time they're going back on a callback because they're readjusting and readjusting. They can be adjusted if you're making just like a quarter turn one way or the other, or even up to a half turn. But if you're getting on a, you know, a couple full turns, um, something's happened. So just be mindful. Oil, oil guys on rack systems is probably your biggest nemesis other than like a, a wire rub or something, a short in the rack that takes a little bit of time as well. But um, oil seems to give us the most problems. It seems to stump the most uh, seasoned technicians. So if you guys are dealing with oil issues, by all means, get a hold of uh, your senior technician or one of us, and and uh, we can we can help you through that that process. Um, we have a couple classes that just cover oil because it is such a such a um, big part of the rack systems. Any questions on this, guys? It's a pretty basic rack. I know you see in the, some of the other bigger markets we do, we can see up to 13, presser, 13 compressors and three different suction groups on the back side of a rack. So they can get pretty, pretty lofty and large. Here's your basic diagram. This is your piping diagram of the rack system. You've got your, refrigerants come, your refrigerant coming in through those EPRs in the case. You're going to run that suction header at least, you know, two to four PSI lower than uh what your your lowest setting on uh your EPRs. If you guys are running your suction header header pressure too close to your EPR pressure within a pound or so, you'll have a tendency with some valves to lock that valve up. So you want to make sure you're running your, your header about two pounds lower, I would say to be safe almost four pounds lower than it, your lowest suction group. So and we can talk about float strategies uh on another day, but you know, you can get pretty, pretty dynamic in how you stage and energy efficiency on how you float the rack and stage the rack. So with these compressors. So as you can see, all the compressors are tied to the same suction header. So depending on how much heat load is coming in through these lines and, and, and raising that suction pressure, um, there's transducers on the suction header that tell it, hey, bring on stage one, and if stage one doesn't bring, bring that uh, suction pressure down to a satisfactory point within a certain amount of time, it's gonna say ramp stage two, and then bring on stage three, or it might say uh, shut, off, shut off two and kick on one and three. So usually what you'll see on your horsepower management on this rack is you'll have like a seven and a half, a 10, a 15, and a, or a seven and a half, a 10, a 12 and a half, and a 15. So, and usually when you get to the end of the rack, you're, you're usually dealing with like a W body or, and not all in lines. So when you see that there, the, the reason for that is because they're going to, they're trying to manage, you know, when systems are coming out of defrost or if you're in the middle of July or if they have a lot of doors open or if it's a busy shopping day for that location of the year, they want to maximize the efficiency of the rack and use it when they can. So one thing that we do see, um, we don't see anymore because they size the rack pretty tight, but some of your older racks, they're grossly oversized. And so you'll, when you're, we're dealing with grossly oversized racks, a lot of times, you know, the stage four or whatever the bigger compressor is won't run it a lot. And it sometimes causes you problems. So make sure when you guys are dealing with rack staging, you're really looking at that strategy. And then how often look at your cycle times. You don't want stage one cycling, you know, does anybody remember how many times we want to see a compressor cycle in an hour? By per manufacturer, Copeland and Bitzer have the same number. They want to see that that compressor cycling between six and eight times an hour. So it doesn't seem like a lot. So they want to get some good run time. The reason for that being is, is like when these compressors short cycle, it doesn't fling the oil around and keep the oil warm inside of that crankcase. And so they want to get some good run time. So when they bring that first stage on, they want that compressor to run. They want it to get nice and warm. They want to get that oil slinging around in that compressor or pumping around in that compressor. So they get good lubrication while they're running. That's the reason for that. Short cycling is really hard on the electrical as well as the compressor itself. So you don't want to, so a good, good thing when you're trying to balance a rack is to make sure that, look at your cycle times, look at your PID uh, on, on your um, control strategies. 
You want to see good, even staging. You want to see it staging through the compressors. Um, you want to see, you know, not a big, huge variation, but most of the time at the, when you get towards the end of the, the rack where you where you have larger compressors, a lot of times because they've been so oversized, especially this time of year where we don't need the load, um, you'll see that last compressor or that large compressor not cycle very often. That's okay. Just keep just keep an eye on, eye, eye on it if it causes you problems. I know some of our satellites and some of our larger markets, we actually valve off for the winter, which is totally fine if you guys have done your load calculations. So as, as you share a, sucks, the, a common header, you're going to obviously share a discharge header. Um, you're going to discharge all that heat out the same header. It's going to hit your separator um, right there. That's where it's, it's a separator because it's exactly what it's doing. Um, the oil is separating from the discharge gas, and then it is feeding the oil through a, a, right here on the smaller line that you guys see here. They step that pressure down. And they want to get that pressure only about 20 to 30 psi higher than the um, than the compressor crankcase pressure. So this is why you'll see on your sep on your oil reservoirs you'll see that little three eighths line with that with that check valve that's stamped for you know 30 30 pounds that goes over to your suction header. So it's relieving the pressure in your oil reservoir 30 pound to 30 pounds higher than your suction pressure, and that ensures that you're getting a good solid flow but you're not blowing the oil into the crankcase so that's the reason for that line so if you overfill that reservoir and you and you pu push through that valve that check valve and you don't allow it to shut then it's going to equalize and you're going to have a hard time getting oil to your compressors <clears throat> so it goes up to the condenser comes through goes through the condenser condenses back into a liquid comes down and shares a common receiver. Most stores like to see these receivers anywhere from 20 to 30% full any given time of the year. Um, and we'll talk about how we maintain that in the winter time. Uh, and then they're gonna send that, it's gonna go through your liquid line. And then there should be a sight glass here after the dryer. And then through the sight glass out to your cases through the, the liquid header. Now this may not be a header. They may use a common liquid line um, a lot of our Costco's use a common liquid line header that actually feeds one line out to the stores and then only brings it back on separate suction groups, se separate suction lines. So if you only see one line going out on some of your older stores, um, that's the reason why you're not seeing liquid lines coming down uh, right next to the suction line, like you would see like maybe on a Husman Super Plus rack. Uh, multiple compressor lubrication. So we kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, when you're dealing with multiple compressor lubrication, that's where you're going to need a couple components. You're going to need that separator. You're going to need that oil reservoir. Uh, you're going to need those step down valves to be able to drop the pressure uh, from discharge pressure down to 30, 30 pounds above suction pressure so that it feeds nicely into those compressors. So, and then it requires oil level controls and then it requires that float there at the, uh, at the compressor. So, if you're not using a float, you're probably using like a Trax oil module or an Alco or whatever. Uh, I have a hard time keeping up with all the different brand changes, but you guys know what I'm talking about. It has that electronic module in there that actually has a sensor inside there in the float, and it feels as the float drops, uh, the oil level drops in the compressor, the, the solenoid valve opens up and allows oil to feed into the compressor until the float comes up. Then it says okay and satisfies. If it doesn't fill, out, fill up within a certain amount of time, it alarms out and locks the compressor out. So, oil separator on rack. Again, you got your discharge that comes in. You got it, it goes through the, the separator and then it goes up to the condenser. So, oil separators, the location is on the discharge line. It's close to the compressors in a warm location. Um, guys, a couple years ago, gosh, more than a couple years ago, um, we had a store in, in Cedar City uh, that was had a really cold machine room, and it had an exposed oil separator, and liquid kept migrating into that oil separator. So it's really important that your machine room stays warm this time of year. So if you get into a machine room and it's got an, an air vent and it's open to the outside, you need to figure out how to get that room warmer, especially if you have a... Uh, an oil separator in there. 
So your, your refrigerant will migrate into the oil uh, if you do, if it's too cold in that machine room. So what well, you, you need to kind of be aware of that. Also, um, <clears throat> we need to, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, just make sure that it's warm and make sure that, um, you know, you guys, how do you know if the, uh, if you're feeding oil or you're feeding liquid into your compressors, what's the quickest way you can check that? Cause sometimes oil and liquid look the same. There's two. By fill. Go ahead. By fill. Where, where are you touching? The compressor, the head on the compressor. Yeah, just actually just tap the, the oil pump. Oil pump, if you guys put your hand on the front of that oil pump, if it's warm, you're good to go. Look at the oil. So if you're pulling foam off the top of the oil, you're probably coming in a little rich. So the oil shouldn't be pulling foam off the top. If it's pulling foam off the top of the oil, it's because there's liquid in there and it's boiling off the top of that oil. So that's, that's, the, that's the visible look. The, the feel look is just, yeah, touch the front of that compressor. If you're touching the head and it's cool, then you got a lot of liquid in there. So if you touch the pump and it's starting to get cool, then you're mixing oil and, and liquid. So you need to make sure, you know, if you're, if you guys are doing that, make sure you get, you know, st stop the rack, um, get the, get the liquid out or hurry and get it pumped out, shut down some uh, of your valves that are flooding back, find out where the liquid's coming from, isolate that valve, keep the rack running and get the liquid pumped out of the, the oil. So as soon as you can, because mixing that, if you're taking it in that this time of year, that's usually what we see. We get a lot of slugging and flooding issues uh, in the compressors because of the cold temperatures and because of the cold machine rooms. So we got to be very mindful of, you know, that, that the first thing you guys should do is when you walk up to a machine room and start touching some heads, start touching some, some oil pumps, you know, put your hand on the side of the uh, oil separator. So if your pump, if you start to fill your pumps and your pumps are cold, the next thing you're going to go is go to your oil, your oil reservoir, wherever the oil is being held and fill that, see if liquid's coming in from there. So, cause it's going to be coming in from two ways into that crankcase. It's either going to be coming through your suction line too rich off of a case, or it's going to be coming right through the oil separator. So that's the way you hurry and eliminate those two, those two uh, places. Um, the purpose of the separator is obviously to separate the oil from the discharge gas. It returns to the compressor carrying case used on large systems with long piping runs. So, uh, you know, depending on the rack you're working on and stuff, you'll still see crankcase heaters on those compressors. Those crankcase heaters should be energizing in the off cycle. And what that does is it helps keep the oil nice and warm inside there in the off cycle, and it helps boil off any liquid refrigerant that may migrate to the compressor. Okay, and that's for small systems too. You want your crankcase energized when the compressor's not running, not when it is running. Um, oil separator, oil control. So you got your oil level control. This is, a, this is a mechanical float. That nut right here at the very top is where you would take off and you would make your adjustment. So and it usually has a sticker on the side that tells you exactly how to adjust that properly. Um, we like to see about a half a glass, a sight glass of oil with Copeland's and most of these guys, you can get down to about a third, uh, and no more than a, a three quarter. You know, you start pushing past that. You're either, you're filling, you're, you're pumping oil or you're starving it. So, you know, no, no less than a third, no more than three quarter. So, but you, what you really ideally want to see is right there down the middle on that sight glass. So when you guys are checking your oil, you need to be not only looking at level, but also look at the color. You know, it should be a nice light brown. And if it's a, if it's a synthetic, like a POE or some of the new oils, it should almost be clear. And that's why we're having a hard time telling the difference between liquid and oil is it runs really, really light. And so sometimes it can be mistaken for liquid. And so all you're going to do is this is where the oil feeds in. Just put your hand on the front of that bell. And if refrigerant's boiling off, that bell is going to be cold. I'm not sorry, that front of that compressor, the bell's on the backside. So, um, but just make sure because right here it should be warm. So these are, this is your valve plate and this line right here, I don't, I don't really recommend grabbing it because during times of the year you can burn your hand pretty fast. So I think all of us have experienced a discharge burn, but that, if that line is anywhere cool, it's because this is, it, you're getting liquid into the system. So EPR, evaporator pressure regulators, this is where we make the case temp adjustment. So a couple things about this style of valve is, you know, if you guys have your gauges hooked up, 
just remember this, the way you turn the stem is the way the needle on your gauge is gonna go. So if you're wanting to drop your pressure, you're gonna turn that stem counterclockwise. If you wanna raise your pressure, you're gonna turn that stem clockwise. So, and just remember when you're warming up a case, it's gonna, you're, you're gonna turn it and it's gonna take a while for that, pre, that temperature to rise in the case. And so it's gonna take a minute or two for your pressure to rise. So when you guys are making adjustments to EPRs, you wanna make an adjustment, turn it a quarter turn up, and then wait. Now, when you're going colder, it goes me almost immediately because you're dropping pressure. So just understand that when you're going warmer, you have to warm up the coil. Your pressure is going to take some time to come up to where you just made your adjustment. So I see a lot of guys getting on EPRs fast, and then they tighten the nut in about, I don't know, 30 seconds and call it a day. And then what do you know? We're back out there because the case is too warmer. So you want to make sure when you guys are adjusting, I usually go pretty warm and then I drop it. So I'll turn it, I'll turn it up maybe a half or three quarters of a turn, and then when I, if I need to warm it up, and then I'll come back to where I wanna be. And then I'll watch it for about, I don't know, 10 minutes, just to make sure that nothing, no unforeseen circumstances at the TXVs or you know, at the case or on the lows is causing the pressures to rise or drop. So you know, hanging out, whenever you guys are dealing with rack refrigeration, just expect to be there for a, a minute or two. Um, it's not like a single system. It's not like a remote. So one EPR valve per suction line. So doesn't mean that it's one EPR per case. You could have six or eight cases tied to the suction line. So on the lineup downstairs, but that is going to adjust the whole lineup. And then, like I said, you might have cases running too warm, warmer or colder within that lineup. That's going to be an expansion valve adjustment. Once you know, you've set this to the correct pressure because refrigerant is temperature pressure related, this is where you're gonna make your first adjust, adjustment. Then you're gonna go over to your um, controller and see what the cases are running at, or you're gonna go downstairs to get a vis visual on it. And then you're gonna start attacking the warmer cases in the lineup once you know that this is set properly. And this is a <clears throat> picture of a, an Alco EPR. So, we use we see a lot more sporlin out there, so but same same concept. It's going to look at a thermistor. It's going to actually look at the case through the controller, and then it's going to have a board that drives that valve to be more of a. This is a much more finite. Some of these 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 uh, valves have thousands of steps, thousands. That's how finite they can run this uh, this seat in and out to maintain the temperature that they want. So rack system controllers, electronic controls increase efficiency. Um, it's just because they, they, they can run a more finite inputs and so they can, and they can run it like a mathematical PID algorithms to actually predict the load shifts on this rack so that it can stage, you know, more quickly and more efficiently and more effectively for the load shifts that happen down at the cases or down in the stores. So it gets input pre from pressure temperature sensors so you're gonna have transducers for the pressure, you're gonna have thermistors for the te pre uh, temperatures, um, you're gonna have outputs that cycle the compressors, the valves and fan motors. Um, and this is where you're gonna have actual boards that drive those um, electronic EPRs on the back of the rack. So obviously high efficiency reduces operating costs. Where they're getting their efficiencies, guys, is they're running tighter compression ratios, um, so they're getting more they're getting more vapor per stroke because they're tight, they're running better. A lot of time they'll use floating strategies, which is again, tightens up that compression ratio. So what floating strategies do is it really gives us a good draw of vapor per stroke on those compressors, which, which really gets efficient in the run time on those compressors, which saves in energy costs. I don't know why this says commercial ice, but we're just gonna go with it. Um, electronic sensors on a parallel rack. So you see all these transducers and temperature sensors throughout the rack that are sending, the, sending this information back to the controller um, so that the rack runs more effectively and efficiently. Let's talk about head pressure control. It's a good time of year to be talking about that. On small systems, you're gonna, you're gonna run a non-adjustable head pressure regulating valve or a headmaster is what we call them in the field. Uh, large systems, an adjustable head pressure regulating valve, uh, plus a differential pressure valve. 
does the same thing. It's just because of the, the amount of load shift and, and the amount of BTUs that you, you have in that, that rack system. So you're going to see these on uh, the headmasters on a lot of the remote systems um, and some, some smaller systems. We used to see headmasters on racks, but I haven't seen one in a while. Um, Albertsons ran a lot of headmasters on their racks for years, but we've, we, we've got away from that. We go to the, the two valve system. So here's one with a headmaster on the top. So what this headmaster does is as, that, as this liquid's running from this condenser, as the temperature drops, there's a charge right here in this head. Okay, and it's push always, it's the same charge, no matter what time of year it is, it's, it's an inert gas like nitrogen. So it's always the opposing this, this pressure. So as long as this pressure right here overcomes this, this diaphragm right here, it just keeps feeding through. As soon as the pressure drops through the condenser, and so the pressure drops here, it's gonna push back on this line, and it's going to start filling this condenser with liquid. As it does that, it's going to reduce the condensing space within the condenser, which is going to raise the pressure. So you may have a, let's just hypothetically say, this is a one ton condenser. So as this temp pressure drops here, this diaphragm is gonna push back on the seat and slowly close and mix this valve. As it mixes this valve, it's going to turn this, it's going to condense and stack the liquid in this condenser. So that's why we see a lot of charging issues in the winter is because we, you know, we, we're stacking in the condenser. I'm sure all of you guys have heard us say that we're stacking that refrigerant in the condenser. And so we're having a hard time getting it back down to the case. But as we do that, the pressure raises because we need that pressure differential at the TXV down at the case in order to push through the TXV. So that's the reason why we have to maintain this head pressure is to get that liquid back down to the case and enough pressure behind that liquid to push it through the expansion valve. So as it does that, it causes it to bypass through this valve. As this seat pushes back here, it opens up this right here. It's gonna blend or fully shut and feed direct discharge gas into the receiver. What happens in the receiver is it continues to condense into a liquid because of the cold receiver outside. And then again, this is an outdoor unit because it's a smaller unit. And then it sends liquid down to the, the uh, case. It's super important that we maintain that head pressure so that we can push through that valve. Any questions on that? This seems to stump guys the most, that, like during the intermediate times of the years, with ice machines and other types of equipment that use headmasters, you know, we'll go back, we'll go out in the morning uh, or in the middle of the day, the thing's locked out on a alarm, we'll reset the ice machine or we'll bring on the system and everything runs fine. So we walk, we do a bunch of checks, we walk away, it does it again a couple days later. What happens is it's getting cold outside and it's stacking this and it's not feeding enough refrigerant down to the machine and therefore it is starving it out and then it goes into an extended freeze or whatever the alarm is. But that is the reason for it is because it's under charge for winter time. So when this starts to stack in the condenser to maintain that pressure, there's not enough refrigerant in the system and then it starves it. <laughs> On headmasters, there is a way to get it running in the summer. You can only do this in the summer when it's never gonna, when it's never gonna bypass here. Um, if it's having a hard time or it's sticking, sometimes you can clip this pigtail right here at the end of the headmaster and get it to run. This is a temporary fix. So no matter what, if you clip that pigtail, you need to still come back and change that headmaster because without fail, you'll clip that pigtail and then you'll be like, hey, it's running and I got 80 other calls to do. And then you'll forget about it in winter and then somebody will get stuck out there in the freezing cold trying to get the headmaster changed out. So let's, you can clip that to get you by, but it's just to, it's just to get by. So this is what we see on our rack systems. You have that adjustable head pressure regulating valve. So, and then you got that pressure differential valve. If you guys notice, it's doing the exact same thing. We're just making the adjustment for the resistance here. Instead of putting a charge in this head, the adjustment's right here. We can raise that pressure and we can stack that gas more or less depending on the adjustment that we make to that valve. Any questions? So supermarket head pressure control, so is the same. We see that that last system that I was showing you, we see on supermarkets, smaller racks, 
This is for our larger rack systems where you'll have an adjustable head pressure control and you'll have a differential valve. Both are adjustable, okay? So we'll see both. <clears throat> Again, if you guys look at that, same concept. It's all doing the same thing. You just need to understand what it's trying to do. We're trying to stack liquid in the, the condenser to eliminate the surface of condensing so that we can keep that head pressure at a certain level so that as it pushes down through this liquid line, we get enough differential across the valve to feed, to good, get a good, nice feeding pattern in that, in, that refer, in that evaporator through the metering device. Split condensers. So on your big market systems, we're, we see a lot of condenser strategies between either the fan control or the split. So two sections of condensers, one section for winter, both sections for summer. The advantage much, le much less refrigerant needed, only the winter condenser is flooded. The other condenser is empty in the winter. So what you guys will see here is you see the valve right here that opens and shut. This valve, will, you see no coil on this side of the valve because this one is always going to feed. The nice thing about it is if this one fails, you can force it open and switch the coil over. So you can still get a half and then change up your strategies. That's why that is piped that way. But this is your discharge line coming in, goes through your valve. So this valve will shut, forcing all the refrigerant through here and forcing all the refrigerant to bleed out of here. And so now you're running at 50% capacity. So, which again, maintains that head pressure. And so instead of stacking a ton of refrigerant in this coil to eliminate the condensing, we just shut off the flow to the condenser and send it through half the condenser to achieve the same outcome. So this is always used winter or summer. This side is always feeding. And then that's just gonna be, it says summer, but you know, whenever it gets above a certain threshold in the control strategy, it's going to shut that valve. So here's just a little piping diagram. Again, you've got your liquid going out, going through your metering device, going through your power back to your compressor. And then it goes from your discharge through your three-way valve to either one of your the one side of your condenser where it always feeds, through your head pressure regulating valve, through, and then you've got your differential valve there again to where it bypasses direct discharge pressure into the valve if we need to still maintain this uh, pressure. Right here, this valve is ensuring that we have good back pressure to feed through that valve right there. Because remember. We need over 100 pounds of pressure differential between the, the, the outlet and the inlet to make sure that this valve gets nice liquid, gets nice push through that TXV. So, and then again, it's just, this is what's when this valve, the three way valve shifts, depending on if it's the temperature's warm enough and it needs that added condensing to maintain that, that head pressure or not. So it'll open up and it'll feed both of, the, both of the sides of the condenser. When this valve shifts, it also tells the logic in the, in the uh, controller to run that, that side of the, 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 that bank of fans for the condenser. System, uh, this looks like a, a nightmare. So, but anyway, this, you, get the, you get the point. You guys see, you know, you can get on racks. This is about a 10 compressor rack system. Um, you've got, you know, multiple racks in this, in this machine room, and then you've got all your refrigerant lines going up, hitting your home runs and heading out to the, to the cases. So you see your rack controllers on the front there. So you see the right here is a thermostore. So it's kind of heat reclaim, hot water recovery tank. So it's another way that we can, you know, maximize our heat gain. So as we pick heat up from the cases, we're going to send it through this tank. We're going to transfer that, that heat to the, to the water from the heat that we pick out from the cases out on the floor. Um, and then we're gonna transfer that heat into the water and then we're gonna send this back out to the condenser and condense the rest of it and then send it back down to the receiver. Um, <clears throat> refrigerant leaks. So electronic leak, leak detectors pinpoint location. Okay guys, I wanna talk about this. I'm still seeing a bunch of the, uh, I see a variation of leak detectors. Um, I'm a big fan of the H10. Uh, cordless. Um, it, it's never failed me in 22 years. 
So I would prefer that you guys are carrying that one. I know that we have a lot of tips and a lot of DTEX. Um, not real happy with them. So I go behind them quite often and find the leak that nobody can find. So um, I prefer the H10 if we, we can have those or a couple in every branch. Um, I'm not real happy with the others. I know that they just came out with a, an Ificon like digital that's like $1,100 um, is what I'm seeing. That's a little much for a leak detector. We we're seeing we can get an H10 for you know around 500 bucks. So, and that's company provided tools. So if you guys need one or a couple for your branch, please give me a call. But that is the, uh, that's the core recommended leak detector by choice. So that's coming from me. I mean, I've just, we've tried others, just not satisfied with the outcome. So alarm circuit notifies the store manager when you guys are dealing with uh, local leak detection. Any racks now are required to have local leak detection. Uh, when you guys are going out and doing your jobs or when you're, if you guys are ever in the controller, just make sure the leak detection is working. It's super, this is a super critical uh, kind of pain point for the customers. If they get a big leak and they, they, the first thing they ask is why didn't the leak detection tell me if they find out their leak detection is not working, they're not very happy about it. So um, they're required by the EPA to have electronic leak detection over a certain threshold of, of pounds held in the system. So we want to make sure that electronic leak detection is working. So the alarm circuit notifies the store manager and then hopefully the refrigerant loss is kept to a minimum. Obviously, if you crack a discharge line, um, it's gonna fog up the store pretty fast. So, but you know, these are meant to, to pick up the small leaks. Um, we, need to, we need to check them on our PMs and we also need to make sure anytime that we're in the controller that we're getting some kind of value reading on those leak detection systems. The average annual leak rate of a supermarkets is about 10% which is quite a bit guys. I mean, you think about the amount of refrigerants, uh, supermarkets out there, your average supermarket holds anywhere from 600 to 1100 pounds of rack. So it's not a, it's not a small amount that we're losing across the country. Um, this is infrared leak detection system. So an IRLDS. So there's a lot of other systems out here. This is just one of them. So you've got your air pump that kind of pumps the air through to take the sample. Um, you got your microprocessor that takes the air sample and sees if there's any parts per millions of refrigerant in the sample. Uh, these, again, we're this is what we're talking about. On this certain specific condenser, we actually have the receiver on the roof with the condenser. You might see that from time to time as well. And like we said, you know, 1,500 pounds of capacity. That's a big boy. So any questions? I'm gonna cover CO2 systems real quick because we got about 20 minutes. So, secondary refrigerant, refrigerant systems. Chiller compressors use primary refrigerant, conventional HFC refrigerants. So, hydrofluorochlora refrigerants. So, that's like 404 now. And we used to use HCFCs and CFCs. Um, those have all been X'd. Um, in 2020, guys, they cannot sell R22. So, we are done with R22. I know there's been a big transition. Um, hopefully we're not seeing a lot out there, but they, are, they absolutely can't sell it anymore in about, I don't know, two weeks. Um, <clears throat> pumps circulate uh, secondary refrigerant, chilled glycol pipe to the cases and plastic tubing. So if you guys are dealing with a glycol skid, if you guys have ever had a chance to work at a supermarket that has a glycol skid, we have a, a few out there that we work on. Um, they're gonna use the glycol in the medium temp circuits. They're still gonna use the HFC for the low temp circuits. So <clears throat> it's more cost effective and more environmentally friendly. It's kind of a pain in the butt to find leaks from time to time. Just make sure that if you're dealing with a glycol skid, don't try to use your H10 to leak check the store. You're probably not gonna find the leak in the, in the medium temp cases. So I say that because I heard a company that was trying to do that. So it was kind of funny. Um, Here's a second nature diagram. So you have your 404 direct expansion system. That's what DX stands for. So you'll hear that term a lot, DX. That's where they're using direct expansion at the, at the point of evaporation. So, and then you've got your, 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 sec, your uh, chiller system where you're gonna have a compressor. You're still gonna use refrigerant. You're gonna send it through a brace plate heat exchanger or shell and tube heat exchanger. And then you're gonna run, you're only gonna have a pump. Now the difference between a compressor and a pump, pumps pump liquid, compressors compress vapor to a higher pressure vapor. So no liquid, liquid. So this is always a liquid, 
glycol. Um, you know, most of our customers will not allow us to put dye in glycol anymore. So because it makes a mess. So you just gotta, you kinda kinda look for that sheen coming out of your drain lines when you have a leak in your glycol. This is a glycol skid. You see your multiple pumps. Usually they stage they're a, and they're usually variable speed. So and then they're gonna use flow valves and circuit setters. So I don't, here's the chiller compressor rack. So that's, that pump pumps all that glycol through a big braze plate heat exchanger on the back side of that rack. And those rack, that rack circuit is just local right there. Typical glycol temp for medium temp. Um, yes and no. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna see a little bit warmer temperatures of that in ours, but you can get it down to as low as 18, you'll be okay. So you start cranking down into the 14, 13, you're gonna start having problems with the glycol as well. You can't run it that cold. So let's talk about circuit setters, guys, because all these guys, I've been I even was taught that these were called certain things. These are called circuit setters. So some guys call them step valves, sometimes guys call them flow valves. Um, that is called a circuit setter. If you call up the manufacturer and you say flow valve, they'll keep asking you questions. If you call up RSD and you say, I need a, a inch and one circuit setter, they're gonna be able to help you right away. So let's make sure, if you guys don't know what that valve is called, it's a circuit setter. So write that down if you're calling it something different. So it calls it something different, even on this slide, I think. Circuitry, similar to DX coils. So you've got flow adjustment valve. See, there you go. No, that's a circuit setter valve. So there's your ball valve to shut off for service and then your pressure trap taps. So anytime you guys are adding glycol, you've got to burp the system. So you just can't like make your repairs and then have a bunch of air in your system. You got to go to the highest point. You got to burp, burp the system. It means you got to bleed out the air out of the circuit that you've isolated. So it's usually pretty close by to that circuit. You can't just like, you know, make your fix and then leave that in there. It's just like refrigerant. You gotta, you gotta evacuate the system. Air in the system is not good. <clears throat> a couple of you have worked on these cases. This is a glycol case where they're sending through, you know, the pan plates, the chiller pans. So we've seen these at Whole Foods, mostly. Barker makes them. So, which is Hill Phoenix now. So let's talk about the CO2 system. So I think we're gonna cover mostly subcritical and we'll, we'll go over what that means. So uh, CO2 is a secondary refrigerant. You're gonna, again, have liquid CO2. You're gonna treat it more like a refrigerant. You're gonna valve it like a refrigerant. It's gonna run a little bit higher pressures, um, but you, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna use compressors in a CO2 system. This one is because it's subcritical uh, and, or, or uh, cascade is another name they call it. It's, it's gonna just use a pump. So you're gonna have that liquid CO2 pump go through the coil and then come back to the, the, the system. You're gonna use a, a, a HFC refrigerant through a braze plate heat exchanger to cool that. So that's what that diagram is showing you. The braze plate heat exchanger is right here. So as that vapor comes up, it's gonna hit the heat exchanger and then it's gonna come back as a liquid. And that's why you're pulling from the bottom so that you always get liquid to feed through your evaporators. So the reason why this is called subcritical, guys, is it never reaches supercritical state. So CO2 goes supercritical at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. A lot of guys say 87.2 or 87.4. We're just going to say 88 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, a lot of times it gets warmer than 88 degrees in, in our regions. So CO2 hasn't made a big push out in our area, but they're coming up with ways to keep that, you know, maintained and to keep that be able to run it efficiently in a supercritical state so and reject that heat so the more they come up with strategies like that the more that we're going to see co2 application because it has a, um, a global warming potential of less than one so it's a very good long-term refrigerant option so co2 as a primary refrigerant upper cascade system is going to use so this is going to be the the top they're going to call this the top side of the circuit so it's going to use that medium temp compressors with the 404 HFC or, or some other refrigerant. It cools the condenser 
of the lower cascade. So the condenser is that brakes plate heat exchanger that I talked about. And then the lower cascade system, that low temp compressor with CO2, cools the low temp evaporators. So if you, if you the, the upper cascade system or you're gonna, the top side is gonna be pretty, pretty textbook, but this is going to be where your evaporation happens at these brace plate heat exchangers because it's going to be picking up the heat of the CO2. And CO2 is extremely efficient in its heat pickup. So you can run it in a lot smaller copper lines to, to get the same amount of enthalpy as you do with a lot larger lines with the HFC. It's extremely efficient refrigerant. We started up a rack in Orem, Utah with a customer and we had the whole store pulled down within 13 minutes. That's how efficient CO2 is. It was insane. So all of us were standing there like just scratching our heads how that was even possible, but it was possible. We watched, we brought every system on. We said, by the time we finished opening all the valves, the first three systems were already at temp and satisfied. So the lower, the low side or bottom side of the loop is it's air cooled condenser. So you got your receiver, you see your upper up top side, but then now you're going to see your, your bottom side or your, uh, of that loop with your receiver. You're going to have low temp compressor, low temp CO2 compressors. So again, we're using compression instead of a pump in this one. So, and then we're going to send it through your metering devices. So anytime you guys are using CO2, they're going to use electronic expansion and electronic evaporator pressure regulators and electronic head pressure control. It's going to be all electronic because it's such a fine, it has to be maintained and monitored and metered so finite that it has to be, it has to go through a, a, a heavy controller. Usually you're going to have case controls in every single case. You're going to have electronic valves or pulse valves in every single case, and you're going to have electronic head pressure controls. So it's going to be, you're going to have very high remote visibility to a CO2 system. So, and then here we have it with a low temp CO2 and a medium temp glycol. So this would be a very expensive setup just because of how many moving parts you have here. But as you can see, you can run all that through, through the brace plate heat exchangers with a suction group and a lower CO2 suction group. The biggest thing when you guys get on CO2 is you'll notice with CO2 compressors, they're much, much smaller than your standard HFC compressor. So, and you, you, you'd be shocked about how much these little guys can, can do with that CO2. Any questions? So, I will answer one thing. When you guys get into just back here where you're not using a, a two stage, where you're going compression and directly into a adiabatic gas cooler, that's transcritical. And the reason why that's called transcritical is because you go from subcritical to supercritical within the same cycle. So that's why it's called transcritical. So when you're talking to a CO2 guy, make sure that you use those terms subcritical or transcritical and don't call it a condenser, call it a gas cooler because that's all you're doing. You're going from a a hot gas, a high pressure gas to a lower pressure gas, and the actual condensing happens in the flash tank. So in from a, a gas to a liquid. And that's the difference between a CO2 system and a regular HFC system that we're used to, is that CO2 is, the terminology is different. If you start calling it a condenser, right away that CO2 tech's gonna know that you're not a CO2 tech. So a little, little word to the wise there. Any questions? That was a lot, guys. So hopefully, hopefully that made sense. You know, I would review this. There's a lot of goodness here. Um, I know a lot of you guys have a desire to be a parallel rack technician. You know, I'll help out wherever I can on that. So we're the managers. We're always looking for good guys that want to come up and do more market work. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot more co complex, and it, is, it does require a lot more time to make your repairs. So just want to be aware of what you're signing up for. But it is very satisfying to be, you know, a master of your craft in this area. So I appreciate you guys' time. Um, let me know where I can help. Have a good day. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim.